Bible says if you offend one of these little ones, you'd be better off with a millstone about your neck. Go swimming. These folks teaching evolution are in serious trouble when they stand before God. First of all, that's not going to happen. Second, even if there really was a God, evolution would still be a verifiable fact of population genetics, fossils, and phylogeny. And the Bible would still be already falsified folklore. Not even the existence of God would change either of these things. Even if there was a God, and it was a creator God, it would respect the fact that it had laid out all of these clues of our evolutionary history and that we picked up on all of that, like the intelligent beings that he made us to be. Because a superior intelligence wouldn't waste its time creating hundreds of species of finches as separate special creations, an intelligent designer would have devised a system to generate biodiversity automatically, which is why finches are a family of passerine birds divided into three subfamilies, further subdivided into 50 genera. They emerge as a familial hierarchy either because they evolved that way or because a deceptive god created an elaborate illusion to make it look like they evolved and thus fool us. So if there is a god, he is either a deceiver or a designer of systems and processes that do the work for him. If such a creator really existed, he would not expect us to reject evident realities to instead believe in a man-made mythology, not when we can prove that much of the sacred scriptures are certainly not true, and that virtually none of that even could be true. Even rabbinical scholars now admit, if they're well-read in archaeology, that the Exodus never happened. And even evangelical Christians trained in genetics admit that evolution is real and that there was never an Adam and Eve. No deity worthy of worship would ever want to be worshipped, and nor would it care whether we believed in it. And if it did, it would know exactly how to convince all of us. The very fact that damnation or salvation allegedly depends on whether you foolishly, gullibly swallowed all of the empty assertions of the interconflicting clergy and their contradictory scriptures is evidence that their claims are false with no truth to it. That it is just pretend, literally make-believe. And no just God would punish anyone over what they believed or whether they believed, and no moral God would allow there to be a hell of infinitely excessive punishment for the mere thought crime of holding a reasonable position based on the evidence at hand. Because that would be the ultimate immorality. And nothing in reality either requires or desires your faith, and the only people who need you to believe in them on faith alone are storytellers, salesmen, and conmen. Religious apologists? are all of those things. Then they tell them we come from a simple, primitive, unicellular organism. Look, just because it's smaller doesn't mean it's simpler. A paramecium is more complicated than a space shuttle, and you can put thousands of those into one drop of water. I often hear that the simplest organism is more complicated than a space shuttle, but the people who say that can never tell me how complex either one is. So how do they know which one is more so, and by how much? How are they measuring this? Even they can't say. Smaller is not simpler. That's one of the lies in the textbooks. I'll show you. Here's a microchip inside a paperclip. Pretty small. Not simple. This microchip is being held in the mouth of an ant, and that little microchip can process every letter of the Bible 200 times per second. Smaller is not simpler. Note that this supposed lie in the textbook is something the textbook never actually said. Instead, the implication is that a unicellular organism is a whole lot simpler than a multicellular organism like us, with the complexity of a single cell compounded 37 trillion times. And not just that, but all of these cells are acting in a coordinated communal organization. That is several orders of magnitude more complex than one independent cell on its own. And if we're talking about the first cells, then we're talking about prokaryotes at best, which are the simplest cells we know of, much simpler than eukaryotes, and much smaller than them, too. I'll show you. Let's compare the brain of a honeybee to NASA's Cray computer. At one time, the world's fastest computer. I think they got a faster one now. The brain of a honeybee is pretty small. The Cray computer is huge. We would all agree there's a size difference, right? Okay. Now, the Cray computer could do six billion calculations per second. It was estimated that the honeybee's brain is doing about a trillion calculations per second, a thousand billion. So that little honeybee brain is about 133 times faster than a Cray computer. 
Those who want to believe that naturally evolved organisms are really divinely invented machines want everything to seem somehow artificial. So they conflate animal brains with computers. But the two are completely different in virtually every respect. Philosophers trying to evaluate the human brain in computer terms admit the caveat that little, if any, of that is particularly conclusive. Even scientists praising the phenomenal computational power of the human brain admit that it is a tangled, seemingly random mess of neurons that do not behave in a predictable manner, which is entirely contrasted from the logical, mathematical construct and function of a computer. And we could say that both process data, but that's where the similarity ends. Even the form of the data and the type of process are in no way similar. It's like comparing apples and Macintosh. No, Microsoft. The Cray uses many megawatts. It's power hungry. The honeybee uses 10 microwatts. Did you know honeybees not only make honey, they fly on honey. That's their energy source. And a honeybee can fly a million miles on one gallon of honey. How would you like a machine that gets a million miles per gallon? Especially at today's price of gas, right? Fill up once and you're done for the rest of your life. This is a Mitsubishi Mirage. I know that higher mileage cars exist, but according to this article in Car and Driver magazine, this is the most fuel efficient car Americans can buy that isn't a hybrid. It gets 39 miles a gallon, the same as my motorcycle gets, because a motorcycle is usually lighter than a car. And my bike has a bigger, more powerful engine with a lot more torque than this car has. But where my bike can reach 150 miles an hour, this 78 horsepower car can go from zero to 60 eventually. I've lived in Texas and all over the southwestern United States most of my life and I've always needed to have a truck. And they've all been bigger, heavier, and more powerful than the Mitsubishi. And none of my trucks could get even half the mileage of that car. And some could only get a third of that, which is another reason to have a motorcycle whenever you don't need to use a truck. The point is that generally the lighter the vehicle is and the smaller the engine for it, the better the mileage. A 50cc scooter can get 100 miles a gallon depending on the weight of the driver. But if you don't have to carry a driver at all, that means you can make it much smaller and lighter and go exponentially further. If you could build a vehicle the size of a bee, it too could go a million miles on a gallon of fuel, even if it did have to fill up almost constantly one drop of petrol at a time. Way more efficient to go electric. The Cray costs $48 million. The honeybee's brain is pretty cheap. <clears throat> you splat them on your windshield all the time, right? Have you noticed how this preacher has no compassion for other animals? Let's put a frog in a blender and turn it on. A guy sent me a couple of weeks ago, about a, month, a couple months ago, I guess, a whole jar full of trilobites from the Prudhoe Bay uh, treatment, water treatment plant up there for the oil uh, um, factory they've got, oil refining uh, rig. When they arrived in Pensacola, Florida, they were still alive in the jar. But I don't know how to keep a trial about alive. I mean, you know, you give it mouth to what, you know, some resuscitation, but they all died, but we got them in our museum there. Somebody spent years crossbreeding dogs to develop the Chihuahua. All that money to make a dog that's 100% useless. He doesn't have much appreciation for nature in general. Love studying Grand Canyon. Actually, it's a bunch of useless real estate. I mean, what would you do with it if you had it, you know? You can look at it and then go home. That's about it. But, I mean, you can't plow it, that's for sure, and you don't want your cows playing out there. Nor does he seem to understand the value of bees. The honeybee's brain is pretty cheap. <clears throat> you splat them on your windshield all the time, right? Many people scramble when the cray breaks down. Nobody heals the honeybee. A self-healing computer. Steve, you work on computers. How do you like one of them? Something crashes, reconfigures itself, fixes it all up, no problem. This is another example of the phenomenal capacity of emergent complexity arising organically from the cellular level. This is what can happen when you have billions of neurons and trillions of glial cells, and many of them can perceive, interpret, store, analyze, and redistribute information at the same time. What you get from that is an interactive system that is much more comprehensive than any computer. Cray weighed 2,300 pounds. Honeybee's brain doesn't weigh too much. So what should we conclude? Let's see, the supercomputer is huge, it is slow, it is very inefficient, it is power hungry, and it had to be designed. We all know that, right? Now, now, just because something is intelligently designed doesn't mean that it necessarily always has to be bulky, slow, costly, and inefficient, even if it often does mean that. But did they turn around and look at the honeybee and say, well, that happened by chance? 
Once again, the preacher is misinterpreting the eventual emergence of complex incidental designs from a sequence of cumulative deterministic processes as if everything just fell together like that. This shows that the preacher has absolutely no idea how evolution works, nor even how chemistry works. And the brain of a human is a whole lot more complex than a honeybee, for heaven's sake. Your brain can hold more information than the entire British library. The human brain is phenomenal, okay? You have more computational power in bits per second than the entire national telephone system. Again, we can't do a fair comparison because they're not the same thing. According to this book by a software architect who is also an astrophysicist, many researchers, being human, expected that the human brain would show a tremendous information processing capability. Interestingly enough, when researchers sought to measure information processing capabilities during intelligent or conscious activities, such as reading or piano playing, they came up with a maximum capability of less than 50 bits per second. It is known, however, that the senses gather some 11 million bits per second from the environment and the body sends 11 million bits per second to the brain for processing. Yet, the conscious mind seems to be able to process only 50 bits per second. It appears that a tremendous amount of compression is taking place if 11 million bits are being reduced into less than 50. And it seems that much of our staggering processing power is actually occupied in the unconscious task of data compression. One brain surgeon estimated that there are more connections in, your, in just one person's brain, there are more connections than the entire electrical system of the United States. How many wires have been connected together in the United States, would you guess, inside every computer and inside every machine and inside every building? Like zillions of them? One brain has more than that. That's because the human brain is an interactive network of 86 billion microscopic cells. And that's the problem with everything this preacher is pleading for right now. Everything you know, everything that that you remember, everything that you're good at, whether it's math or music or comedy or strategy, comes from synaptic connections in the brain. If you study a new subject or rehearse a performance, whether martial arts or music or whatever, you are building physical connections in your material brain to improve your memory and aptitude to recall and recite such things. That's why they say that the brain is like a muscle. Training yourself to learn a new language when you're middle-aged may even keep your mind stronger longer, just like regularly working out in the gym. And likewise, physical influences like injuries, surgeries, drugs, or disease may also affect, alter, impair, or enhance not just your cognitive ability, but your proclivities and even your personality. All of these, your mind and memory, passions and preferences, everything that makes you who you think you are, is material and inextricable from the physical form. And that's the downside, the disadvantage of brain matter when compared to computers. You can shut a computer down completely and start it up again years later, and it'll run with all the software intact. But your mind cannot be stored in a system that has been shut down and stored away. If you discharge capacitors in a computer, sometimes that'll fix a glitch in the system. But if you do or allow the equivalent in a living brain, then it's done and dead. Operating system not found. In a computer, hardware is inherently separate from software, but that is not the case with the living brain. Your self, whatever that is, cannot be transmitted elsewhere, nor installed into a different body despite some superstitious beliefs. And regardless what any religion teaches, the information maintained in your mind can neither download from nor be uploaded to any cloud.
This is the most fuel efficient car Americans can buy that isn't also a hybrid. No, 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 you can't go back there. Don't, no, 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 you're not going to be on camera. Yep, go lay down. Go lay down. Lay down. Yeah, be good, doggy. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. Big old boy. I'm trying to record. You have a beautiful smile. No, 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 no. All the other dogs now want attention. Go, 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 go. Lay down. Lay down. <sighs> Hi. <laughs> okay. Call it. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Let me record. Let me record. Okay.